Hello and greetings and welcome to this worship gathering hosted online by Eastgate Baptist Church on the weekend of December the 20th, 2020. This is the week of Christmas. My name is Jerome Taylor and it is my privilege to be with you today in this our hope as a church that this would be a meaningful tool to help you grow in your faith with the Lord Jesus. We hope to be a church that helps people to do that by being a place and a people among where they may belong and feel safe and loved and cared for just as Christ cared for us, that we would faithfully teach God's word so that they may believe and trust in who he is, what he says, what he has done and what it means for our life. And that believing you would be grow and become more like Jesus. That is our goal as a church, to become like him, to love like him, to live like him, to speak like him, so that the world may see him and glorify him through us. And that is why the church's mission is, as we are growing like him, to be sent out to the world to make a difference in the name of Christ, through the love of Christ, with the word of Christ, all to the glory of Christ. We want to be that church. And today, if you are looking for information about us, we invite you to check out eScapeBaptist.org, or you can certainly peruse about our resources on social media. I hope they'll be useful to you and help you take your next step with Christ. As always, each week, we're very, very grateful to those who have chosen to give, to those who are choosing to give and show their generosity to make what we do possible by helping us meet our obligations, uh, by helping us help our partners in good faith to do their work and to help meet the needs of this city and the world uh, that God has brought to our doorsteps. We want to make a difference there. And if you would like to help contribute and maybe you haven't before, you can certainly do the old fashioned way with the address listed, or you may follow us online by going to eScapeBaptist.org or using the text atmosphere to give. And I, we appreciate every single person that does it. We do not take that lightly. Thank you for trusting us in that uh, charity and that kindness and that faithfulness to this work. We also want to make sure that if there are requests that are on your heart, we never want to seem calloused. We want to pray for the needs of people as they reach out and, and, and uh, have burdens on their hearts. We want to help them. So if we can be praying for you, you can certainly comment or message us. We want to pray for you and, and hopefully encourage you in your walk as we pray. Uh, and if there's things that are burdens during this time when things are super stressful, we want you to know that the church is here to lift you up. But we also want you to know that we're here to praise the Lord with you. If you have things that you would like to celebrate and we can pray and praise God, pray to God and praise God for, we would love to do that with you. But in all things, our hope is that this church would be useful and helpful, encouraging, and a place where you can grow with Jesus and the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and that that would bring him glory from this day into eternity. Let us pray to that end today as we prepare our hearts uh, to continue in worship, as we prepare our hearts for this week of Christmas, as we prepare our hearts to be on mission, whether in our home or wherever the Lord would use us this week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I would ask that you help your church today to grow with you, to understand you a little bit more than we did the day before, to trust you a little bit more than the day we did before, to listen to you a little bit more than the day we did before, and to be modeled after you, to, to be reflective of who you are in word and deed this week. I pray even right now that you would, in your Holy Spirit, help us to have ears that hear, eyes that see, hearts ready to receive your word, and that whatever you would have for your church today, for us to worship you and glorify you, and also for us to be prepared to share you and to help others know you this week. I pray that you would have your way in this time. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and ask this. Amen. And amen. You guys are just going to have a conversation directly with Dave and ignore the camera. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, what does it mean to be Italian? Italian means to be full of life. It means to love life, to love people, to 
enjoy eating. It means to talk with your hands. It means, it means taking time to get to know somebody. It, it means to be a part of a family. It's more about the importance of a relationship. It's more about the importance of caring about the person that you've just spent the last two or three hours with and not wanting that to end. Are your kids American or Italian? <laughs> they are not totally American and they are not totally Italian. They're a mixture of both of them. English is different their first language, but Italian is different their first culture. Cavallo, fatto di legno. Benissimo. They go to Italian schools. Their friends are Italian. They, they attend church in Italian. They go play in Italian. They go to swim class in Italian. Um, our neighbors, all Italian. And so they know how to, you know, be Italian in our Italian world. I think it's very important as uh, missionaries, as international workers, that we become part of the culture. We'll never truly be Italian, and that we'll never be Italian. We understand that. But it's important for us to engage and be a part of the culture. You know, we're there to love the people of Italy, and we can't love the people of Italy if we don't know the people of Italy. Why are you in Italy? We're in Italy because we love people. It's not just a calling to be there, it's truly we feel passionate about being there, about seeing them become Christ, about developing relationships, about being an incarnational witness in a place that really needs uh, to know Christ in a living way. One of the, the key hallmarks of the ministry is utilizing different avenues to multiply ourselves, uh, whether it be state conventions, churches, or college students. And every summer we host about anywhere from 10 to 15, sometimes even 20 college students. And we're placing them in cities all around us. And these college students, by spending six or eight weeks there, working alongside interning these local churches, are able to share the gospel a thousand or more times. And it's getting the gospel a lot further, a lot faster, and more impactful than we ever could. What keeps you here? What keeps me here? Um, it's people like Federico who we helped him plant a church a few years ago, and now he's working on a second church in a place called Spoleto. Or Ilaria, who, who is seeking, who, who wants to know more about Jesus. I feel like Marco. So I walked into a pizzeria and prayed over a meal, and him and the waiters asked me, are you a believer? I said, yeah. He says, well, I am too. And encouraged them as they're part of their local church. It's about Paula, who is a fellow believer who mm. just lost her husband, who's who's struggling and, and, and needs walking beside. It's like Fabio, voilà. the owner of the gelateria that we mm. like to go to. Yeah, he's, he's crazy. He's, he's, he's crazy. <laughs> who's always so happy to see us when we come in. It's about Patrizia, who, who really wants to seek the Lord, but is still so enrooted with her policies and traditions. And it's, it's for Marisa, who is undergoing mm. cancer treatments, but knows that, that we pray for her daily. It's about the people. It's about caring enough about the people that we want them to know Jesus. Welcome everyone. Let's begin today with the lighting of our Advent candles. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. We light these candles as a sign of our waiting and hope in the coming Christ. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Joyful 
nations rise Join the triumph of the skies Nature rise and worship Him Who is born at Bethlehem Hark the herald's angels sing Glory to the newborn King Christ by eyes, heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord Late in time Behold Him come Offspring of a virgin Veiled in flesh The Godhead see Hail the incarnate deity Pleased is man with men to appear Jesus our Now let's read from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching over silent flocks by night, Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds and tremble when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it
Christ was born And God sent us salvation That blessed Christmas Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let her receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. And to heaven and heaven. Today, as we journey together in God's Word to hear it proclaimed, to see who the Lord Jesus is and, and what He does and what He says, our goal is to seek to know Jesus by following Him through the Gospels. And today, we are going to be in our series of following the chronological life of Jesus as eyewitness through the books, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These eyewitness, these historians, we're going to venture to see Jesus facing obstacles, seeing what it means that he does something so new, it provokes our tendency to be hesitant towards change, to have something different. And we're going to see what that looks like today. So I would encourage you to see how Jesus is going to do something new through the scripture by journeying with me in the Gospel of Luke. That's the third book of the New Testament, the third gospel. Uh, and we're going to be in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And I see that that says chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 on the screen. Uh, that's just user error, and we're just going to roll with it where we are. We're actually in chapter 5, verses 33 through uh, 39 today. So, that's how it does whenever I am editing. Sorry, I apl uh, apologize for that. Here we go. We're, I want you to know that as we journey together, though, in the Bible, you can certainly check out the Bible app and to 
If you were needing a Bible, you can request one by texting Bible to uh, the, the number on the screen. But let's journey in the Scripture together. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. And as we look at this, we're going to see and this, this huge question of Jesus facing so many obstacles from the religious. Out of all the people He would face obstacles from, it's incredible that He faces them from the religious. And we're going to see how the reason and the difference that is made is that the Gospels are telling us, they're showing us that our religious practices must, should, and, and will align with God's re revelation to us in Christ Jesus if we follow Jesus. So here we go, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. And it says in the Word, Then they said to him, John's disciples fast often, and say prayers. And those of the Pharisees do the same, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? And I see I missed it on the screen. But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them and they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. It will spill, and the skins will be ruined. No, new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and no one after drinking old wine wants new. Because he says, the old is better. So, let's pray, because we need it right now. Lord Jesus, I ask that as we look at your word, that you would have your way in it. Um, help us all to be drawn near to your presence and to serve you, to know you, to understand what all this means as it applies to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So anytime we dive into the scripture, we, we have a goal. And that is to answer some questions so that we may gain a deeper understanding of scripture so that we may have a deeper faith and following of Jesus. Uh, so the question is, what does it say? And that's why we looked at Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39, the actual text we're in today. And we want to see what it says, not merely theorizing about ideas about Jesus, but what does, based on the given gracious authority of God's Word that is sufficient to change our lives, what does it say? But then, as we spend time together, uh, some things can be a little confusing. You may have never really thought about old wineskins and new wineskins or new patches or old patches of garments or the bridegroom and fasting. But we're going to see what it means today. What is Jesus speaking in that first century message to first century listeners so that we may see what God was saying in that time and place and never try to strip the word away from its meaning, its original intent, because God's word will remain the same forever. It will never fade away. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we must never try to strip away what God has graciously given us in His Word. We must see what it means. And then we may see how it applies, taking that meaning into our current context. But lastly, will we trust what God is saying to us? As the Word rubs against us, are we willing to, to lay aside whatever may be of hindrance or obstacle to following Jesus, instead of being an obstacle to Jesus, will we lay those aside and trust Him and have our way of life renewed, transformed, and aligned with God's will as He does this new thing in our life called faith and life with Him. So, here we go. Why does Jesus face so many obstacles. 
As we go through the Gospels, you'll see figures that, that try to resist and reject what he's saying, try to test him and challenge him, try to fight him, even seeking to kill him and destroy him. We'll learn about those in the coming days as resistance to Jesus in his life grew greater. But today, as we spend time together, we're looking at uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39, but you find the parallels, the, the other eyewitness accounts of what was going on in this time in Matthew 9, 14 through 17, and Mark 2, verses 18 through 22. It's amazing how the Bible presents us this history from certain vantage points that we may see all the totality of what was going on here. But there's something beautiful about Jesus. When we follow Him, we, uh, we see that what He does is He brings about a new creation. That's what the Bible tells us, that if anyone is in Christ, uh, there's a new creation. The old things have passed away, and look, the new has come. And, and this is telling us something about Jesus, that Jesus is not meant to be some kind of passive engagement or hobby in our life. He's not meant to just be a quick patch fix up for the little things that are wrong with us, even though there are plenty of things that are wrong for us. In other words, Jesus didn't come just to tweak a few flaws. He came to give us a born again life, a new life, not to improve us and say, well, you have a few dings and dents here. Let me brush that out and polish that out for you. No, he comes to make us new. And this is true not only in the, the personal disciple level as an individual, it is true of churches, it is true of faith, it is true of the entire system that Jesus brought about something new, and that brought resistance. Anytime someone wants to bring about a change, there is always pushback, because something in our human nature always seeks to stay within our realm of comfort. We like a few new tweaks to, you know, entice our desires, but if it's changing everything about us, that is challenging and revolutionary. And we see Jesus bringing that about not only in the lives of individuals, but across the entire system of faith that what God was doing with his arrival, when we celebrate Christmas, it is a new thing. He is making life in the desert, if you will, springing up new life, as the Old Testament would tell us. This is the picture, and Jesus would face obstacles in that. But when he does this, we're going to see an unlikely alliance develop in the middle of this. As he faces this moment, he's being questioned by a dual, a trio of people actually that would not usually mesh too well. But why is this taking place? It's because when we think about the gospel of Christ, when we think about the Christian faith, the doctrine of salvation, what we see is that what Jesus has come to accomplish is not something just to add to what was already there. No, it was completely insufficient. He has come to bring that which is sufficient and superseding and completely changing it. And this text is going to address some of the misunderstandings that people have between Judaism and Christianity. There are some people that believe that Christians have one way to be saved and Jewish people have one way to be saved. No, the Christ is the one who comes to save all people and all people must come to faith through Him. And our Lord makes a clear distinction here that He is coming to transform and transition Everything from what was to something new that is. We'll look at that a little bit more as we get through this. So let's look at first at verse 33. You see this unusual coalition of the Pharisees. These were the religious elite. There were about 6,000 of them throughout the entirety of Judea and Galilee. 6,000. That was a very small population of the body. But these were the religiously astute. Now they weren't the ones that were... Uh, the aristocrats and, and the people with incredible, incredible pedigrees, if you will, although some of them were very educated, some of them did come from noble families, these were the ones that were seeking to be very fervent and zealous 
for the Lord's will. But you also have in this unlikely alliance some questionings come about and from, according to the eyewitness accounts of Mark and Matthew and Luke, from the disciples of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was one that wore uh, camel's hair vestments and leather belt, and he lived out in the desert. He was kind of an ascetic. He was kind of uh, a different person. You know, he was not exactly uh, all captivated by all the other social comforts. And then you have the crowds of Capernaum who witnessed what Jesus has been doing, and now just recently have witnessed him calling a tax collector and other sinners to follow after him. And he's had dinner with them. He's, he's enjoying their welcome, hosting him as their guest. And here, this unlikely allowance comes up that how could you eat and drink? Isn't, isn't the life of holiness and virtue that of being somber and stoic and, and withdrawing from the comforts of this world? In fact, the, the Pharisees, their habits of fasting, as they looked forward to the day of the Roman oppression being taken away, as they looked forward to the day of the Messiah's coming, even though they didn't realize the Messiah was right there in their midst, they were looking forward to the Lord's return. Now, the habits that was faced in the first century, the Pharisees, they fasted Mondays and Thursdays of the week, the second day of the week, and the second, third, fourth, fifth day of the week, Thursday. They would follow after that pattern from sunrise to sunset. So it was one of those things that when the sun rose, they didn't eat. And when the sun went down, they could eat regular food. But during the daytime, they, they fasted. And they would make themselves appear to be in sorrow and somber and woe because they were fasting. It was a sign of their religiosity, if you will. But that wasn't required of by the law. That was a tradition that they had developed. A pattern that made them feel engaged. And that's okay if that was their choice to, to pray and fast on those days. There's nothing wrong with having a regiment of, of fasting if, if the Lord has laid that upon your heart as conviction. But what they're doing is trying to say, Jesus, you should do like us. You should do like John's disciples. Now, there was only one command for the whole nation to fast according to Scripture, and that was for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. But they had developed this pattern to where it made them feel holier by what they had done. And because it made them feel holier, in their convictions and their practice, they felt like every person of virtue, of stature, of worthy of following, every person should follow the same traditions they did, and they certainly should not partake in the comforts of feasting and joy. Something suspicious about joy. It's, it's, it's not meant to, faith is not supposed to be something that makes you happy or lively or enthusiastic. That seems too much like the world. That seems too much like smiling. And so they sought to try to suppress what they saw in Jesus with Levi and the tax collectors and the sinners that were inviting him into their home to eat and drink instead of him fasting and withdrawing and depriving himself and not being merry. That's what they wanted. And here is a warning to us. You see, the word Pharisee is used kind of as a dirty word this day and age. You don't want to be a Pharisee. But there's, as one theologian put it, one step in becoming a self-religious Pharisee is using our own personal religious examples as a requirement for everyone else to obey. Notice what they said. John's disciples fast often and say prayers. And those of the Pharisees do the same. But yours eat and drink. Jesus, based on our experience, you should be like us. The warning is that many of us do that. Jesus, based on our experience, you should want to do like us. It is the right way after all. 
Instead of Jesus, there is joy in you. Help me trust you and see your way and walk along with it. Help me find the joy of my faith, the joy found in you as my Savior. And even if it deprives me of the taste that I'm accustomed to, may it lead me to new refined tastes that are enjoyed with you as you lead and as you direct. May I follow those convictions that are laid by you upon my life. Be warning, be warned against unlikely alliances that seek to team up against the Jesus found in Scripture. You also see a unique moment here. Yes, Jesus faced obstacles, but how did he handle it? How did he deal with it? How did he show that the, the response is to have our life realigned, renewed, refreshed, transformed, even recreated? to mimic and, and reflect the revelation of God found in Christ Jesus. How did that take place? Well, you see Jesus presenting just this unconceivable answer, unconceivable to the people of that day because they did not realize who they were dealing with. Jesus said, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them and then, then they will fast in those days. He's using this imagery of the bridegroom and the wedding, and it's powerful, it's beautiful, it's, it's redemptive, it's loving, and it's worthy of finding joy in. But just to see the power in it. This is not the first time that God has used the imagery of being the bridegroom and the husband to his people, redeeming them, ransoming them, rescuing them, and calling them under his wing. The book of Hosea tells us that in that day, this is the Lord's declaration, you will call me my husband, and I will take you to be my wife, my bride forever. I will take you to be my bride in righteousness, justice, love, and compassion. I will take you to be my bride in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. Think about this incredible and to the ears that were listening, and maybe you were listening today, this unconceivable answer from Jesus. He's saying, I love you like the best groom loves his bride. Why do I do that? Because I am the groom. I am the one that was spoken. Jesus is not being very subtle here to those that knew the scripture. He's saying, I'm, I'm God. I am the bridegroom, and I'm here with the guest. I'm before them. And this is not a day of fasting and stoicness and, and somberness. Imagine, if you will, that you go to a wedding, and you say, oh, I'm not eating that. It's been paid for by the bride and the groom, but I'm not eating that. Oh, I'm not dancing. Oh, I'm not... I'm not Presence, that's too far. That's, that's too frivolous. That's too joyful. You're going to look like a grumpy Gus. You're going to look out of place. Because that is a time of celebration of life and what God has brought together. It's meant to be delight. It's, it's meant to bring joy and gladness. And, and, and you're meant to feast on what has been provided for you. To do otherwise seems contrary to what you're there for. And to see Jesus is to discover Him and all the joy that is found in Him. To see that there is no greater source of joy anywhere in life. And because of that, certainly, if there is no greater source of joy than Jesus then there is no greater reason for celebration than Jesus. To take delight in Him. And life with Jesus is meant to be feasting, joy with Him. It's not to be a funeral. He's alive. And Jesus Christ is the only one when we know Him that can make that kind of difference in our life. When we see that Jesus came to save sinners, to rescue that which was lost, 
to seek and to save them. That is meant to bring gladness, not sadness. Oh, Jesus wants to rescue me. Yes, it is humbling. But it is also, wow, Jesus. Jesus loves me. He wants to rescue me. He wants to redeem me. He wants to walk with me and know me and, and live with me. This is the picture. Now, it's a reminder here. Jesus said that one day the people will fast. The bridegroom will be taken away. He is foreshadowing. He is telling what is going to happen to him in the future so that the bride will receive the price for her sin. And it will be his shed blood. He says on that day they will be fasting. You look through the book of Acts, the disciples fasted plenty of times. They were praying and looking forward to the return of the Lord. They were praying and seeking the discernible will of the Lord. So fasting is not a banished or to be abolished principle. We're going to look at that when we look at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says you should fast. There will be times for fasting. But it doesn't mean we should go about our whole life stoic. Woe is me. That we find in Jesus, we crave in Jesus, joy. Because he is the redeemer. And he has welcomed us as his guest. He has purchased us as his beloved. So let us live in the joy of being beloved. Then we see Jesus furthering this imagery. He presents an understandable argument to the people of that day. He told them a parable that no one pairs a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only would he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, it will spill, and the wines, the skins will be ruined, and so will the wine. No new wine is put into fresh, no, new wine is put into fresh wineskins. And then he says, no one after drinking the old wine wants new because he says the old is better. Now that can be a little confusing because we try to read our own inference and our own answer to what Jesus is trying to say here. But Jesus gives them a picture of why the joy found in him, why the newness that is discovered in him, why what is old is passing away and what is new has come is true and why it is desirable. You see, with the coming Messiah, with the arrival of the Messiah, God with us, mighty God, everlasting Father, wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, the Word that became flesh, with the Messiah, the anointed ones arriving, it was the signal that God had brought about the completion of the Jewish provision. It was completed because it was no longer anywhere close to being sufficient. It was always insufficient, but now it's not even on the same wavelength. It's not even on the same radar. And Jesus... With Jesus, the Hebrew faith finds its ultimate fulfillment and completion in being the faith for all. The real McCoy has arrived. And so we don't continue to worship in the old ways, the old patterns. To do so is to try to create something false and disingenuous and something that is not salvific, is not redemptive. And he gives this imagery of a parable, in a, in a parable. His parables were stories that Jesus would tell to, to explain what he was meaning in an earthly context. Trying to explain something that has heavenly ramifications in an earthly context. And here he gives this imagery about how the good, the new is. And how the old is not worth it. So imagine you have an old pair of torn blue jeans. You love these blue jeans. They've always been comfortable blue jeans. But they are ratted out. They are nasty and stained and torn and tattered. 
They're just not good. But you decide to go to the mall or whatever store you go to, because you know people don't go to malls that much anymore. But anyways, you decide to go to a store and you get a brand new pair of, let's just say generic blue jeans, because I don't, I don't get paid to sponsor anybody. But you get them. And you say, you know what? I've got these new jeans. But I'm going to tear them up. I'm going to tear patches in them to try to fix my old, messed up, tattered up jeans. I'm going to get my new t-shirt to fix my old, stained, ratted out t-shirt. That doesn't make any sense. One, you're tearing up a perfectly good piece of garment so it's no longer useful. You're also trying to put unshrunk cloth on an old piece of cloth, and as soon as you wash it, it's going to tear more. And three, it's not going to look right. It's going to be mismatched. It's going to be hodgepodge. And this is what takes place when we try to say, I want just a little bit of Jesus and his newness and his flavor to fill in all the messed up, sinful, tattered up, ratted out attempts at righteousness that I have. I want the fillingness and, and fullness and ever expanding, advancing nature of Jesus, but I want to try to pour him in and fit him into my old way of life. No, something's going to give. Something's going to burst. And Jesus tells us these imagery so that we would not be confused. That what we're longing for is to put away the old self. We're longing for the old creation to be done away and pass away. We need the new, and the new is found in him, and the new is good. But the warning that Jesus gives at the very end of these, this area of the new and old wineskins, saying new wineskins are put into new, new wine is put into new wineskins because the new goat skins, they have the ability to, to take the, the breath and the, and the growth of the fermentation in this wine, and, and, and they'll stretch they're new and ready and prepared for it. They've been made new, but the older, they won't receive it. But he warns those who say, nah, I've been with the old all my life. I don't need anything new. I, I like my way of life. It's better. People grow accustomed to their taste, but they can grow accustomed to a taste that leads them away from Jesus. There are certain people that don't like the same things I like. I understand that. We're going to disagree on those things. But the hope of our life is to help get people to the one thing that changes us all, that we all need, and that is Jesus. The one who is God in all of his fullness, the bridegroom that loves us. He is the one that has come to be among us so that we in our sinful, ratted, tattered, stained, torn, filthy, unrighteous estate can have the new removed and be brought in the old removed and have the new presented to us through the Holy Spirit for us to taste and see how good it is. How precious and delicious and delightful and joy-giving and refreshing is the Lord. And we're invited to have this only by Jesus, the one that we celebrate that came, only by Him being with us are we able to have the sufficient one, the sufficient provision of grace, the sufficient testimony of truth, the sufficient revelation of glory, and the sufficient source and authority for who we would place our faith in. And we are all held personally responsible to what we will do with Jesus. Finding in Him the newness of life. Yes, it will transform everything else about us. It will stop us from trying to fix a cookie-cutter Christianity uh, patched and hodgepodge to our own delights and measures but one that delights in Jesus and what Jesus delights in. That is the goal. 
And the Bible says that we can taste and see that the Lord is good by coming to him in faith, by calling on his name. And the Bible says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord in faith, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's, that's an act of faith, that we trust in him and respond to him. And we ask him to save us. And he is that savior of the world. A savior that provides us the gift that only he purchased and only he can provide through the work of the cross and his resurrection, the gift of eternal life. And only he can work in us, transforming everything inside and out to do that which is new, to take away the old and bring us a new creation. That is what happens when we are in Christ. God does something new. I pray that you know what it means to be in Christ. I pray that you know what it means and have trusted and followed him. I pray you as a Christian would say, Lord, help me not try to suffice and take just what I think is good and what I think is the best taste, but help me follow wherever you lead, whatever that may be. Help me seek your will. That's our goal as a church. And if we could help you in following Jesus in that way, we want to be that resource in your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank, I consider it a privilege and honor to be invited and welcomed into these homes today. And I pray that you would use it as only you can for your glory in a way that would bring about our good by us knowing your grace and hearing the good news of your gospel. Now that we have heard it, let us also be those that carry it and share it with a world that needs it so much. This week and every week. Amen. If we can help you in any way in the near future, if you have questions, need someone to pray for you, I would encourage you to reach out to us here at eastgatebaptist.org. We would love to be that resource to you. And if you're in the Flint, Michigan area, please feel free to come check us out over here on Atherton Road. Until next time, may God bless you richly and amazingly beyond anything you would ever imagine because of Christ. I pray you know him and follow him. God bless.